Loop. I'm available for parties, so uh, not that good. This was DevOps Days Austin, so uh, we just ad hoc like got up there and started jamming. It was pretty awesome. So. Um, for those who don't know my background, um, I've done a lot of stuff. Um, just to quickly run through it, because some of it's going to be sort of, sort of a narrative of what this presentation is about, too. Um, um, I'm only going to tell you about the last 12 years, because I'm not going to tell you. I'm actually... I'm going to be 60 next week, so 40 years in this industry, uh, way too long to be doing this nonsense. But, um, I, uh, you know, about 12, 11, 12 years ago, I joined Canonical, um, and they were coming out with one of the first private clouds, it's pre-open stack, and, um, and that didn't go well, <laughs> but um, it was interesting. And then I joined Chef, I was the ninth person in Chef. I was actually the old person then at Chef, um, and uh, really kind of built most of the customer-facing side of that company, and then... Uh, Went on and did another startup that I sold to Dell. Um, um, actually, as a joke with HR, they asked what my title was. I said, Director of DevOps. And I kind of paused, and they didn't get the joke, so that was my title. Um, <laughs> hey. um, it looks good on a resume, I guess. I don't know. And then about three and a half, I, when you get to my age, you start like years and how many. So if I say three, it might mean six. If I say six, it might mean three. I don't know. Um, the, um, I did this thing where I got this crazy idea to integrate networking with Docker uh, because they were a bunch of kids that didn't really understand networking. <laughs> Brilliant kids, but um, so we built an SDN interface, um, software-defined network interface for, um, for Docker. I did a startup called SocketPlane. The reason you never heard of it, it was sold in less than three months. So I spent two years at Docker and the eye of the hurricane. Um, and then uh, about two years ago, uh, a friend of mine convinced me to kind of jump out and, uh, and the, um, go back and do um, like non-vendor. So I spent almost like 10 or 12 years with, as a vendor. And even though most people that know me, I'm a very meta. Like, so I, I kind of wear two hats. I got one hat where I study this organizational, how organizations work, how organizational performance um, if you look on the right hand of that thing, I've done, I've, I'm one of the kind of co-founders of the DevOps movement, per se, although the movement is full of thousands and thousands of people who have, you know, contributed, so I, I'm not saying that I, I invented it. <laughs> um, but I was kind of the, uh, one, the only person, the first, um, only American at the first DevOps day, and I've been working with Gene Kim on this enterprise, DevOps Enterprise Summit for many years. Um, I've gotten sort of involved in DevSecOps as a movement. Um, and, then, um, and then I've been lucky enough, I was co-author of DevOps Handbook and then did a, a really interesting project I'll talk later with Gene. It was uh, five years, it was an audio only where we wanted to talk about how Gene created, how many people have read The Phoenix Project? Okay, fair amount. Um, I would suggest reading The Phoenix Project. Uh, I don't make any money off it, although you might wind up buying this one if you read it, so <laughs> indirectly. Um, it, it's a novel. So we wanted to do five years after, and we, it, we, we, um, we really tried to get into the history of why DevOps is what it is. So anyway, and uh, just a couple more things about me. I'm, I'm hopefully, by the end of this year, uh, we'll have another book out called The DevSecOps Handbook. Um, and um, you know, if you don't know Shannon Leitz, Google her. Uh, I don't think anybody, I have not met anybody who has a better footing and grounding of understanding a financial institution and the risks in cyber that I've met, and I've met a lot of people. Uh, she runs a 50-person red team, team at Intuit. 50-person red team at Intuit, right? Just let that one sink in. And the stuff she's writing about is insane. You can watch her presentations. Uh, James Wicked is over at uh, Single Sciences, Ernest myself. All right, enough about me. How many people are new to DevOps? Kind of entry, just, you know, just getting started. Really, come on, be a little more honest. You're too late. It's over. Sorry, California. It ended last year. 
So um, I'm kind of half kidding. The thing is that um, it's like every movement, lean, agile. I mean, like, I thought the presentations were great yesterday, and this is not a comment on any of the presentations. But when we start using phrases like agile is to here to here, DevOps is from here to here, and then SRE is from here to here, like, then it is over. The, the, the evil forces have won. Not that anybody, I mean, again, those were great presentations. I'm, I'm a big fan of SRE. Trust me, I'm a big fan of SRE. I think Agile is absolutely necessary as part of DevOps. But I think that um, maybe we've lost course. course. You know, so I, I, I think about DevOps more in, um, you know, this is what I say to myself, is DevOps is a set of patterns and practices that turn human capital into high performing organization capital. End of sentence, done. So when you say that it starts here and ends here, I'm like, <laughs> okay, which part of that human capital and high performance does they, you know, where do we, oh, it's, oh, it started here. So, uh, and I'm not saying mine is right, right? I mean, if you're going in and doing incredible automation, like what you told me, I'm a big fan of, of um, basically JFrog. I, I love those guys. I love their culture. I love their, I love Snowman. I love everything about them. So not a negative about their view, because it's very helpful. I think they're one of the better solutions for what they do. But if, if you get myopic about that being DevOps, I don't know. I worry about that. So I'm not looking to blame anybody. And that brings me really to how I'm leading into what this presentation is about, is that if we tribe everything, right, we tend to lose the, what we're really trying to do. Because I mean, the tools are awesome. But the tools are nothing without the people. And anybody who has tried this for more than 30 minutes <laughs> will tell you this is a people problem. And one of the problems that we have, and I was, up until about two years ago, I was as guilty as anybody else. I'd come into an organization, and I'd fling my handbook at all the people, and I'd say, this is how you do, and this is how you become a high-performance organization. And, 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 and I'd basically say it was DevOps. And then the agile people say, well, it's, I think it's us. Well, maybe it's both of us, you know? But the thing is, what I found was, remember I told you I was with the vendor for like 10 or 12 years. Uh, I really studied this. I've worked on a lot of different transformations. And when I went out and said, you know, I'm gonna go do this on my own. And I realized that, you know, I was wrong and maybe some of my peers are wrong about how we approach this. We bring our little tribe or our toolbox, and by the way, DevOps is a tribe, and again, I make a good living off of DevOps, so I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. But if we bring our little toolbox with our tribe, and then we just kind of fixate ourselves there, then we, we might lose track of, if you agree with me, that what we're really trying to do is to turn human capital into high performing organizational capital. So what I do now is, I, and I, I kind of worked into this backwards. I mean, originally I came in, I'm like, I'm going to do lean value stream mapping, and I have a great way of doing it. And then I'd get these people in the room, and I'd, I'd realize every time I tried to stop them with some sort of, of kind of prescriptive methodology, I stopped losing truth. Like this great conversation going on, I'm like, well, no, no, sorry. We're doing lean value stream mapping, and you have to put a box there. Oh, phew. It takes me 15 minutes to get them back to this frenzied truth Telling. So more and more I go in places, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to basically ask questions and unravel truth. You know, people come in the room like, I don't agree with DevOps. I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> We're not going to talk about DevOps. Right? And so, um, you know, another thing, too, this is, uh, I, you know, I, I, I get involved in a lot of things. I, I did a fair amount of research on burnout. There was a young man who committed suicide in... Um, in the LA DevOps, and it really hit me hard, so I wrote an article about it, and, and it, it just kind of cascaded for a whole year. I did a lot of presentations on research on burnout, and I happened to meet Christina Maslach, who is the, is the premier um, expert, industry expert on occupational burnout, and I, I, I was interviewing her recently, and we were just talking about change, and she said this thing, and I, and I mangled what she said, but it, it basically said, you know, whenever you're talking about any kind of change or improvement, and you're counting on a bunch of human beings to change and make this happen, if they aren't part of figuring out how to do it, the change will be dead on arrival. 
So if we're not talking, and here's the other thing, right? We go, I, I, anybody in this room, you know, if you're in this room, I'm going to assume you're, you have a reasonableness of knowledge that you've read some books, you're here for this reason, you can get the right books, watch the right presentations, and probably successfully DevOps 5 or 8% of any organization on the planet. I mean, it's hard, but it's not that hard. What is incredibly hard is the other 95%. And the reason we make it really hard is we get this success bias. We actually win those first 5%. We convince management that this, it's all over. This is the way. And then what do we do? We go to the rest of the organization and say, hey, get on board or get out. And we haven't even talked to them. And the truth is, that other 85% are like, what are these people talking about? Don't they know that TIPCO can't even generate source code? Like, you need to put everything in a source and, and get. Yeah, I can't. It doesn't matter. The, state, the source of truth of this 50-year-old middleware, middleware product doesn't have source code. So what do they do? They dump out XML, automate it to a script that puts it into Git, so now they can automate it. Like, that, that, those, that's the kind of the nonsense we're doing with the other 90%, because we're not sitting down and talking to them, because we're so, we have a confirmation bias that we're so right about this DevOps thing. And by the way, we are right, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, th does that make sense? I mean, we're right, but we, and I'll say one more thing, right? I can walk into any bank that's over 50 years old, and I know what their stack looks like. I know basically what their, their data warehousing looks like. I know what their middle level looks like. I know they probably have a COBOL mainframe application that's a system of record that if they're really advanced, it's actually talking to containers and Kubernetes through IBM data pipe. I mean, like, I know what it looks like. And I know that, let's say, just 10 things you probably should do that will make you a high-performing organization. And up two years ago, I would just walk in and fling books and say, let's do this. What I don't know is all the institutionalized behavior and culture and memory muscle of that other 90% that I haven't, I, my arrogance has blinded me to go ask. So what I do now is I go in low tech, no computers. I ask just to talk to people. And here's the other thing. I want to talk to them. It, like, I want to get you to kind of build, run, and we'll talk about this, and I want you to get, like, two pizza team and DevOps glorious stuff. But if I go in and I try to artificially talk to you in that artificial environment, I don't get the whole truth. So what I do is, like, if tell me the way you're structured on your org chart, and I want to talk to the team so in their team's natural habitat. Because I'll get incredible amount of truth if the other teams aren't in that room. By the way, no managers are allowed in the room either. And I don't want the people that are like, John, you got to get in here to help us. No, nope, you're not allowed in. What do you mean I'm not allowed in? I'm the one that paid to go. Sorry, can't come in. And we literally use flip charts. And by the end of one week, I have 150 of these. And I go spend a weekend <laughs> in a hotel room, and I put them on the walls of some conference room they let me use for free, because nobody's using it. And I start aggregating all this stuff. And just to give you a little template, like an example might be, and, and I, you know, it's kind of taking a snapshot because you can't, I do this in like a two or three week period. I don't want to spend a year in your company. I can't, I won't. But what I want to do is get a little picture and teach you how to do this. So we, we have a great, usually I go in for two days, a little bit of discovery, then we try to figure out which are the right teams. So on Monday I might spend a whole day with a finance team, development team. Tuesday might be some core services. Wednesday, Wednesday might be web properties. Thursday, we take a handful of infrastructure people. Classic example. When I get to the infrastructure people, I say something like, uh, and, and I don't know if you said old uh, Columbo, you know, he's a, I don't know, I'm just dumb. Kind of help me understand this, right? And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, so you, you, like you don't play the, uh, you know, you're wrong, you know. And um, so I go to the infrastructure. And by the way, I, I grew up, I think I was born with a, a label that said ops person. Right? My whole career has been basically something in operations in some sort. Right? Um, and um, so I love ops, but we're the worst. Right? So we get to Thursday and you say, hey, um, 
are there any, is there any friction with resource requests or anything from developers? No, glorious pictures, bunny rabbits, chirping birds. Huh, because I heard that every time they ask for either memory or storage, you basically cut it in half. Well, of course we do, they're idiots. <laughs> and then there's some folklore of how they misuse and misallocate and this like self-deregulating system. Right? But like, you don't get that truth if they're all in the same room. And so what I found were there were these archetypes. There's what I called the seven archetypes, and nobody understood what I meant. Um, and got rejected to do any keynotes. So I changed it to seven deadly diseases. Now everybody's accepting it. But it's really just patterns. And actually, over time, I, recently I changed number three, bumped one out. It's actually, it's, it, you got you to gotta hold it. Your, uh, your disease has to be deadly enough to stay in the list, right? Um, and I'm going to go through each one of these. You know, and depending on the time, I may go fast on it. There's ones I really want to concentrate, and some a lot of you probably already know. And Mark's scared to death that I'm going to go all over Conway's law, so I'm going to leave most of that for him, <laughs> because he's going to go a really good presentation in the next presentation on Conway's law, or part of it, so I'm going to skip through there. Um, so the first deadly disease is uh, measuring and managing work or making work visible. And I mean visible in that like you actually know somewhere historically that you did the work. This is fun. Monday I get in a room, a bunch of developers. They're all angry. And the, the way this really works is when I'm working for CIO, because CIO says you must go. And by the way, this guy with sneakers says don't bring your laptop, so don't bring your laptop. Right, that's a hard, <laughs> hard gig, right? And they're all arms crossed and like another, let me just destroy this guy. You know, I'll make mincemeat out of him. And I'm, I'm taking the bullets, you know. And so the, but the, then like, I've got this routine. And I'm no genius. I I've, I've just keep learning, like, how to do this better. So the first thing I do on a, on a blank um, uh, note pad, you know, sketching pad, is draw a box. I just step back. And now everybody's like, what in the hell is going on? And I'm like, where does work start? On average, every team for an hour wants to argue with me about why that's not a good question. <laughs> but John, you don't stand. It's way more complicated here to answer that. I'm like, you know, I get it, but can you just answer it? Well, John, you know, it's very complicated. There's things, and there's people, and there's Wednesdays, and there's, you know, um, it rains sometimes. And, and um, no, I get it. Those rainy days are hell. But, uh, but, um, and finally, I get to the point where I'm sort of getting angry, but I know this is happening, so I'm like, I calm myself down. I say, all right, it's Monday morning. You open your laptop. You look at something. Where did that something come from? <laughs> and then, just, then you have this glorious breakthrough, because the rest of the day is this glorious truth serum. If you must know. And then all of a sudden, you just start getting this pouring out of truth. And what you find is... Because then you could ask these like would be horrible questions if you started with, what percentage of work do you actually capture? But you've just had that battle, and they're not up for another battle for an hour with me. So they're like, and I, it's like, just a swag, okay, 40% is uncaptured. So second kind of pattern or truth in this invisible work is that I find most places I go, and these are large institutions, large, you know, large cap companies, um, that they capture, on average, only 50% of all the work they do. So I go back to the CIO. So jump ahead. I've gone through all the things, NCO. John, how do we do? I'm like, not good. And uh, it's like, okay, what do you mean by that? I'm like, okay. The, the plane thing is a little broken now because of, I don't want to jump on a tragedy. But I say, if you build planes, I wouldn't fly on them. And then they say, okay, well, you know, a good CIO is like, you know, okay, you know. Stop with the platitudes. Explain to me what you mean. I'm like, well, I think you have about a billion dollar IT budget. And from what I've uncovered in the last three weeks, you only capture about 50% of all the work is electronically or even any record of that work. And if you did that in your finance department, you would be out of business in a month. Huh. Maybe we put over the hold on that CICD project. I don't know, right? Like, we don't even know. 
Are we surgery in the dark? Is the 50% we're not capturing the 80% value? Like, so we have to have a, you know, like, we, and I'm not like rigid, everything has to be, you know, we're not deterministic ticket stampers. But the, also, I want to drive you through some of these better practices, which is developer methodologies, and everything's a JIRA ticket, which actually leads me into the second deadly sin. Well, again, the problems are you really don't know anything about your organization. Us computer scientists and how data is so important, and in general, most billion dollar above IT departments only capture 50% of the data of what they're doing. Um, you know, how can you be accurate? How do you understand anything? And then you can't even begin to uncover. I do, through this organization Forensics and Questions, find a lot of hidden workarounds. But you can't even begin to start that if you're not capturing work and being able to ask questions about the work. There's a great story in the Phoenix Project. You know, there were, another example that happens a lot, which is, you, um, you ask somebody, they say, well, and you, they start categorizing certain type of work that they don't document. And you say, why? Well, that's uh, Sue's team, and they're very responsible. We know when they give us the work, it has everything we need. It usually takes less than a half an hour. And then I start ripping apart, like, concept of downstream dependencies. You know, there's, a, there's a kind of funny story in the Phoenix Project where somebody's like, like, this is a half an hour pro thing. Why is it taking 63 hours to do? And Gene Kim brilliantly does a little bit of a very simplistic Little's Law where he says basically what you do, if you have queues of 90%, then on average any hour of work is going to be actually nine hour in a queue. And if there's seven downstream dependencies, you've got seven to do the work. What people don't realize is I took work from Sue, and the work I got to do is 30 minutes. But there might be six or seven downstream dependencies. Well, that's not my problem. But I never get to uncover that because the, the half an hour amount of work that I thought was actually going to be a half an hour actually turned out to be two weeks because somebody else is, I don't know, doing something crazy that they won't get back to me. So there's a really good book, and I'll document this and you can read it. It was a, a white paper called, uh, it's, it's a small, it's, a, it's kind of an e-book, but it's a, over. Uh, Overcoming efficiency, multiple work systems, and this idea of like looking for, and these are things I look for, like handoffs, batch sizes, you know, stuff like that. But again, I'm, I'm really trying to uncover less about the forensics of DevOps and the forensics of just your organizational. Again, I want the people that don't, really haven't heard about DevOps. So the second deadly sin, really, it just falls right in line, is most companies have, on average, eight to 10 different ways of the 50% that they're capturing work systems. Ticket systems. We use Slack. Uh, uh, well, no, we use SharePoint. We use Jira. We use Remedy. We use Request for Service in Remedy. We use this homegrown system. We use email. We use the, hey, Bob, can you go ahead and do that? And you tell CIO, you know, by the way, you got 10 different ticketing. He says, oh, we do not. I spent $8 million a year for BMC. I have one. <laughs> you got eight, pal. <laughs> Sorry to inform you. Um, and there are, you know, again, depending on the amount of time and what, what focus is, you know, we, we all know there's lots of, and I'll talk about service catalog a little bit, but, you know, that's another, there's another minefield happening where people are like, John, we're great DevOps, we don't need your help, uh, and we got 32 different ways to do CI, CD. Like, um, yeah, that's going to be a problem someday. You know, so, um, you know, you really want to... Um, I mean, you know, the two work together, right? If I'm going to have a, like, I, I need to capture work. And the reason I want to capture work is not because we want to be ITIL, ITCMF, and we want to have this check mark that we capture all the work, because we want to start driving, actually, I want to get you on a path to the high performance thing, which is, I want, I, not everybody tomorrow can move to a development-based methodology mindset for work. But if I get everybody capturing work, and then this kind of second principle, it's, it's, uh, it's actually referred to here, I've used it, sort of a strangler pattern. Look, so if JIRA is going to be your kind of work system, don't tell everybody on Monday they got to use JIRA. Build an underlying infrastructure so it all starts funneling to that. And though some teams might, it might be a, a long time before they can get to that kind of agility of delivery. I would say that you know, DevOps is not linear, although we do round peg square hole it. Team one, team two, team three. How come team four is not working? Right? Um, but what we want to do is at least get team four or team 15 in line with this. So we make these kind of changes that, like, and they're all going to 
move at different cadences. Because in our large organizations, we still have mainframes. And we're not, like a lot of them are not going away tomorrow. Right? And so like we have to deal with the fact that we have to look at this as a very inclusive methodology that moves at different speeds, but with the same terminology and the same goal and the tra same two dots. Uh, which gets me in the third one, and this is one where I, it's really just my, been eye-opening. It was actually the last client I was at. I kind of knew this was bubbling up, but now I'm like, oh my God, this might be the scariest thing of all, which is the kind of misalignment of, and I, I don't know a better way to describe it, but what we think about is ITCMF, ITMS, SMM, and Cod Native. We have organizations that are still doing Wednesday cabs, workloads that are driven, that are uh, very subjective in nature and how they work. And then on somewhere in the organization, people are well beyond Istio and Envoy, experimenting, and I'll go through some of the stuff like Spiffy and OPA and like some really advanced service stuff. And those two places, they, I mean, one's a rabbit and the other's a, a turtle, and I mean, they are separating at a speed that is engulfing. Right, and, 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 and leadership, they, uh, they don't even understand that, that um, accelerated separation is happening. Because this was funny. This was just yesterday. Michael Cote was commenting on Rob Johnson's, you know, in defense of YAML, which really wasn't a defense of YAML. <laughs> and um, it was, it's a great article. It's out there on um, the Atomist. There is his startup. The guy who rent, rented Spring, and now he has this other thing, which is kind of anti-YAML, which I don't know. I'm not anti-YAML either. But I don't like the idea of seeing variables and script, embedded scripts in YAML. We've gone too far, <laughs> a bridge too far. Does that not scare anybody? You know, 3,000 line YAMLs <laughs> with variables up front and then embedded script invocation, bash shell scripts. You know, uh, take a look at Helm charts. And like, I mean, like Kubernetes is great, but man, like we got, and it's not just that, right? It is, so, and I'll come back to that, right? It, which is, I'm watching my time. Um, what is the CMDB today? This uh, configuration management database. Now, by the way, most companies that come into it, they're still a group, and the CIO is still paying a ton of money to a company to maintain a CMD. By the way, on average, is on a good day 30% accurate which is always in some catch-up mode. And by the way, when you talk to people on the edge about the CMDB, they say, I don't trust the model, I don't use it, I, I make my own list. This is never accurate. When you ask the cyber person, what do you do with an Equifax-like breach, like a, a critical or a high, right? A, a, you know, a critical is a 10, which is the highest it gets, which was basically stretched to at Equifax, right? Um, I mean, people will tell you, I don't know if it's application related, I don't know why, because I don't trust CMDB and it's not accurate. So I don't know who the service owners are. And by the way, five years ago, that was really scary. It was five years, a company like uh, Capital One, Topo Powell, his first fellow there, kind of the head DevOps person there, would tell you he had to manage 400 applications. Today, he would tell you he manages 40,000 applications. Anybody want to, come on, who? Who wants to win a free glass of water? Why? Microservices, of course, right? Um, like, like, we thought it was hard to keep like cloud and cloud native and all this stuff in containers in sync with CMDB before we started getting into services. And, and not only to services, like what, what, is, what does this all mean? I mean, so I'm gonna step back again. I've been doing this 40 years. I think there's a neat value in an accurate CMDB. I think what we do today is theater and a waste of money. And what I'd like to think is that we could actually get these things back together. It's the same thing when we start talking about service catalog. And then, again, when we start talking about what is, you know, what is service level, first of all, SLAs, capital B U L L S H I T. Night Capital, $450 million lost in 30, 40 minutes out of business 24 hours. The only way they could have recouped their money is get Lloyd's in London write a derivative. That's an SLA. 
The stakes are so high. If somebody dies because of your service, like that, there is no SLA for Boeing on that. Whoever wrote that software? Was it four nines? Three nines? I mean, again, I hate to be, make light of a tragedy, but SLAs are just, it, it's the wrong way of thinking about things. Sorry. Now, SLOs, I think, are brilliant because they're internal. They have teeth. I, again, Jennifer's presentation was excellent yesterday. But again, if, if there are service management SLAs, uh, maybe I till five will talk about SRE. We're off kilter. And then like, all right, I'm sorry if you've never heard of any of this, but I'm almost certain that most of this is happening in your company right now. How many people have heard of Istio Envoy? Wow, okay, that's not, that's not a judgment call. Um, because that, that means that you probably hadn't heard of Spiffy. Yeah. And then OPA. Now, if we have developers in the room, you should have heard of Swagger, right? How many have heard of Swagger? Yeah, a lot more. Good, good. But, like, in the small amount of time that I have to try to express my concern um, is that, let me say this. How many, I asked this the other night, how many people actually engage in pen testing against their API tree. The same amount of people that we had the other night. You, I'll tell you, the bad guys, bad people, they're two steps ahead of us. Um, we're not even setting the right grounding for how we think about artifacts and what should stay together, let alone what does the CMDB look like. Because when we're doing discovery and design, not only should we have security and developers, we should also be thinking about the artifacts that are going to be, there's this notion of a deployable mesh or deployment mesh, not just a mesh, service mesh, but what is the mesh of the services that have to go through the deployment? Um, the Swagger API doc. Make me king for a day in your bank. You don't get through the TDD process or CI if I find out that I can bust through one of your APIs. You've got like a, you know, ATM slash user slash ID slash get. Or not get, but, you know, um, info. And that one's unprotected. It just pops right in through an HTTP request. I mean, you do know the, the largest breach, financial breach in the history of our industry was Equifax, $5 billion, still market cap, two years later, and that's not counting the lost opportunity cost, was basically a, a curl statement that ran a shell script to start the kill chain, right? We just need one developer who put up an older Jenkins system that was going to, ran out of time on Saturday, was going to delete it on Monday, but got sick on Monday, and it just stayed up in there. You'll never see him again. I mean, you know how long, and so I don't know, Marriott is a pretty nasty breach that hasn't been fully unraveled yet. They were in there for four years. They lived in Marriott for four years. Imagine what kind of damage somebody who really wants to do. There's, two, there's a couple of adversaries. This is why I run out of time, right? I think of things. There's the adversaries that want to brag how smart they are. And in fact, the people at Equifax, I, I, I've done some investigation, nothing formal, are like, this could have been way worse. Because they got the kind of adversaries that wanted to prove that Equifax was, you know, they, they were smarter than Equifax, and then just, or it was a nation state that wanted to disrupt, you know, our economy. The ones that people really worry about, like Shan Leitz, are the ones who get to live in your place for th two years or a year and start doing stuff for financial gain. Manipulate loan applications. Um, change data. Change data that you don't know that they changed, and then from they announce that the data's changed and you can't recover it. Right? Um, anyway, so back to here. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that are definitely related to services that really need to be thought about way left in a CMDB context, but I would argue that I know no companies that are having those serious conversations. Because Spiffy is a way, a really cool product now, it's part of CNCF, that actually you can do um, kind of auth in a service mesh. So you can do kind of a dynamic authentication of services to service and who can talk to you. It's really almost like an SDN for service to service communication. 
And this is the, you know, when I get into like, we're not, like, are we treating API design and inventory and then risk as first class citizens? So um, a buddy of mine at Aetna told me that they couldn't find a product that did this. They actually paid money to two people to write a product to do it, to basically do discovery classification and pen test. Can you honestly say that if somebody went in there, you wouldn't have some reds right now in your organization? Only three people raised their hand, so. I, you know, I don't know what the right answer is. What I do is try to at least uncover these things. And by the way, I hardly ever get follow-on work <laughs> because it's a shoot the messenger. The CIO is furious, and they're, like, really worried about all these things. Um, but you know what? They pay me for the three weeks. I'm good. Um, so a couple more. Yeah, we're good doing our own time. So four is this... Um, it's just the tribal nature of what we do, right? Like, so there's been some great talks over the years of people who have looked at uh, cultural anthropology and how, you know, how we kind of, you know, there's some good stuff out there to some material. Um, I don't know. I know Lindsay is speaking today. I'd never miss Lindsay Holmwood's presentation. He's, like, incredible. Um, last year um, in Sydney, he, you know, he just, he, I hope he's going to geek on some of what he usually geeks on, um, but he does a, a really good job on kind of, tying in a lot of these cognitive and things that um, get in our way. But we tend to be tribes. And, you know, for those who read the Phoenix Project, right, the Brent was a, was a singular tribe, right, was the one person who literally everybody had to go to. And Brent was that, you know, the kind of person that never said no. But Brent never had any time to teach anybody else how all the knowledge. So you find, I find when I do this kind of discovery, the first one I did, we call it Lou. And this guy, and, and Lou, you know, so now I just call it the Lou circle. And you start, like I told you, you might have 200 flip charts. I'll start seeing these Lou's all over the place. Right? And, and so, like, everybody kind of knows that there is a Lou or a Sue or a Bob or a Jane. But, but they, they don't really understand the um, where, you know, and some of them are like, well, this is not really, really meaningful work, but oh my goodness, I had no idea this was a bottleneck. You know, you read the Phoenix Project, you use theory constraints, but also we have tribes as well, right? I mean, I am a, in all transparency, I'm a shareholder and chef, right? So this is not a negative chef, but we're, I'm the chef person. What are you doing over there? Huh, I'm not sure you should be doing that. You know, right? Like, we do that. Like, you know, like, you're not the chef person. You're the IT person. The fact that you've got, you're an industry leader and expert, and you speak at ChefCon, which, by the way, first time I'm ever speaking at ChefCon since I worked there this year. And, uh, and they do do a really cool music thing, so I'm going to be up on stage singing so, with Adam. So that'll be cool. But you find the lose. And then, again, there are the, the, the Phoenix Project is basically this story. You, um, you find the constraint. You exploit the constraint. You subordinate activities to it. Um, you know, some simplistic ways is, um, I took it out, but like, not just that you gonna sl use Slack, and Slack is awesome, but you could actually convince the CIO, let me tell you why you want Slack, not because it's awesome, because all the cool kids are using it, because if you let Lou create an office hours channel, and you gave Lou some kind of bandwidth, then Lou could actually, um, actually start answering questions and creating repeatable answers, and even create some simple automation, remediation automation to answer the questions that are most commonly answered, right? And you start, and here's what you really want, is you want to s s um, normalize or kind of make the mountains of tribes into flatlands, institutional. You want to turn tribal knowledge into institutional knowledge. It's the only way you will survive. Because the, the one thing you see, I always ask me when, because John, you know, all that stuff's great, but let me ask you one question. I'm a Boston-based company, and I have a hard time hiring these kids out of Harvard, MIT, and Boston College. Because they all want to go out to a startup, or they want to Silicon Valley. And then we talk a little about how you can do that, I and mean, you need to make yourself look attractive. But then I say, that's not your real problem. Your real problem is the ones that you get, you don't keep. Because these really smart kids that actually could take a job with Facebook or whoever or Google decide to stay in this financial institution because they feel like they might get a little of both and they had a minor in fi finance. But after about eight months of going to Lou and being told that Lou can't tell them how to do it, just giving me the work, I'll do it myself, 
I feel like I'm too young, I'm too smart, I'm single. I'm going to call, hey, Google, I'll take that job now. Right, so we scare away our young, the people that we actually, in our banks, that are so hard to capture that we, every once in a while, we get one. And then a year later, they leave. Because they're just tired of this tribal nature of, they want to learn. What do you want to do? Why are you here? I would hope you're not here because you think that you're going to make more money by leaving here today. I would hope that you're here because you want to learn and you have an insatiable appetite to learn. Because guess what? I've made a lot of money in my career. Not looking to find to make money. To have this unbelievable appetite to learn. That's for you young people. The old people are like, screw you. I'm like five years from retirement. Shut up. Um, I, this is what I'm not going to steal Mark's thunder. Um, but the incongruent organizational design, um, I know uh, Jane talked about this a little yesterday about, you know, um, so um, I'll, I'll leave kind of most of Conway and Taylorism, I don't know if you can talk about Taylorism but Conway's law, um, but like in the institutional silos, what we typically have is these I-shaped individuals, I'm the Oracle DBA, um, ultimately what we try to do is get to a notion of kind of T-shaped. So I'm still the Oracle DBA, but I can do my SQL, Postgres, and by the way, I, I know how to script in Python and, and Node and, you know, right? Okay. And then ultimately, the fighting force companies have E-shaped or combs, right? And, uh, and so we're, you know, we're really trying to get, like, this idea that, like, and in, in today's world, I-shapes don't work. Because this, be, the horizontalization of the technology and complexity that we're getting every day, we, it just demands us to have more skills than just one. And the rapid change of influx, whether we're merging or acquiring or dropping divisions or creating new divisions, demands that we have more than one skill. And if we don't, our competitors might, right? Um, Anyway, so Conway's law, and, I, and again, I'm going to save this for Mark because I promised I would, and I'm sure he'll do a great job on it. Um, but basically, so I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to let you read that. Um, the, <laughs> Mark, am I a nice dude? Why? Um, so, um, but we, we do talk about somewhat, not, we do have Conway's in DevOps handbook, and we did cover this uh, Harvard professor who talks about um, functional oriented versus market oriented, uh, you adapt, and, and, and quite frankly, you could say that like a f one form of kind of um, anti-Conway is a microservices where, you know, we tend to build the kind of ATM application or the, you know, the finance payroll application, and we're not really thinking about the customer demand, and what we're really trying to do now in this new world is really kind of um, anti-Conway it. So, and one way is to kind of, a microservices, like, or domain-driven. So we figure out kind of domain-driven services, and which is more adaptable to the market that were the orientation, our ability to rapidly change, the fact that we have it's a lot of component parts, we can place them and put them together. And ultimately, so back to early when I said I want the CIO, I don't want to tell the CIO that the other 95% is doomed, which is by the way what Gartner says, bimodal. Most that is the winning nonsense award of the decade, uh, bimodal. Um, you know, just leave that alone, right? It's system of record. Uh, I'm like, no, we're all going to get there. We're just going to get there at different speeds, and this is where you want to be. Sorry, you're not going to like it. Today, a lot, of, a lot of people, and I like this term, build run teams. Uh, some people call it two pizza teams. So remember I said earlier, we do a stranglehold pattern. We capture all the work. Everything's going down to something like Jira. I don't care if it's something other than Jira, but it's, it's a developed methodology. And so, and now, we're starting to create the moving parts of the organization at different speeds, so that each service is a circle of all the experts that, and this really gets to the point where now we don't have like subjective authority of cabs and Wednesday afternoons with people who are, have been there for 40 years and I think that should go, that one shouldn't go. Like the people here, because there's two variables. It's risk and value. And there's nobody better in the organization to evaluate risk and value than the product ownership group or the service owner or I would call the build run team. So the first objection you get 
from a CIO, which is the obvious objective that most people come to, and there was a point in my life where I thought this was a reasonable objective, sorry, um, which was, isn't that redundant? Why would I spend all this extra money when I could put all those together in one group? Right? And, um, and what I would say is, this is the debt you pay up front to create a, a firefighting, crazy, amazing force of E-shaped individuals. So what you pay up front in your kind of what seems like redundancy over time becomes the kind of working force that you need, which is, because this, you get this osmosis. If anybody's worked on a build-run team, like you literally, you're a small team, and even if you don't know anything about networking, you learn networking. If you know security, you know security. I mean, everybody starts having to learn everything else. And over time now, you have this kind of E-shaped army, and it's a hard sell. You know, because most people are looking at pure ROI, but like, I would tell you the people who adopt this and build towards this will destroy their competitors because the nature of our industry is the technology changes. I mean, Kubernetes didn't exist five years ago. Back or what? It's going to be six years this year. Like, like the technology's changed so fast, this idea of specialization, that is like, you are basically doing it wrong. And then, you know, managing complexity, right? This is another thing. Like, you can look at that, again, I'm trying to cover things that basically should be one, each one of these should be a one-day workshop. But you do need to give way to um, the fact that, like, how systems and complex systems work. Because we, in most of our systems these days, these are complex systems. And the treat them like um, deterministic, like, this is what it looks like right now, it, it, it's just not that way. So it, it's, it, the analogy um, that I've used, and I do it in Beyond the Phoenix Project, is we, 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 we need to do what happened in physics, you know, from Newtonian to quantum. We actually need to do that in IT. In fact, Mark Burgess has written a couple of great books on this. Um, in, in IT, when we think about complex systems, when we drop the apple, it may not fall, right? And um, because, you know, and again, I'm not going to profess that I'm an you know, extreme novice in quantum physics, but the point is we have to rethink the location of things that are going to happen through predictability. And so there, uh, there's a lot of ways to attack this. I mean, it doesn't like we have to all become quantum physicists. We can understand that blame cultures are a form of anti-complexity. You did it. Hey, we're done. He broke it. Let's move on. Until the next time we find out it was something else and it was five other things, and right? Like blame is, a, is the ultimate um, canvas for building an ugly picture of not fixing anything. Which, by the way, this one hurts your head, and I'm not going to debate it now. If you want to have the discussion later, root cause analysis, root cause thinking is wrong in complex systems. It's not going to happen the same way you said two times, just eight. Physics demands that it won't. So root cause thinking is a wrong way when we start getting into complex incident management and trying to understand. And, and so I, I will point you to John Osbar, to Richard Cook, um, psychological unsafety. Um, you know, uh, we start thinking more like scientists, we will um, we'll have this um, ability for the person who's on the job one day in a room with people who've been there 25 years, that person can say, I think it works like this, and the reason everybody won't yell at that person, or if that person happens to be a female and it's a bunch of old men who are kind of assholes, if you, are, if you think like scientists, then it's an experiment. And then go prove your experiment. It's the natural equalizer. Um, you know, there's a, a notion of pluralist to ignorance. Um, and um, that's where we tend to let complex systems, like we think everybody else must think it works okay, so why should I argue? And we just kind of like keep falling into this, you know, we, you know um, and uh, normalization of deviance. This is actually Diane Vaughn had written a whole bunch of uh, work on uh, Columbia, the challenge in Columbia disasters, and this idea that we, we t tend to make deviant behavior and say, well, it never broke it before. I don't think it will break it this time. You know, they, they were, yesterday there was the 
Murphy's Law quote. Sidney Decker, who's, I guess, I say up the road and everybody yells at me, <laughs> Brisbane. Um, but um, the, for me, it's up the road, right? I, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. But, um, he, you know, he says that Murphy was wrong. It's, it's everything that can go wrong goes right. Right? That, like, there's a possibility that you're sitting on the precipice of disaster. And Giles Ospar says, it's not amazing that things break. It's amazing that things actually work. <laughs> and then so John, and then now this is like, if, if you're like, oh, my God, please shut this guy up. Only 16 minutes. Um, dark debt. John and it, like, so you, have you heard of dark matter, right? Dark matter, like, so you can, don't quote me. But somewhere between 85 and 90% of everything in the universe, the smartest people in the world don't know what it is. So everything between me and you, 85% of it, the smartest people in the world, have no clue what it is. Right? All right. Um, you know, 10%, we have the quantum, like we can predict what it is. So they're saying that in complex incident resolution in large corporations, we need to think more about things as dark debt and really sort of adopt kind of a quantum way of thinking about how we think about emergence and patterns and predictability and observability of people as opposed to deterministic. You know, if we lay this down, it's all going to work. Until it doesn't, then we have to tweak it, and then we lay this down. Right? And um, we spent a fair amount of time in... Um, in the Phoenix Project, the Beyond the Phoenix Project, it's an audio only, but... Um, uh, one of the things that um, I originally started where I really wanted to interview Gene about, like, why did he write? You know, I, I have this great opportunity. I have really cool friends. So if I sound smart, it's just because some really smart people let me hang out with them. Um, and I listen. Um, and Gene is one of those people I get to hang out with. So we were having these conversations about, what, why did you create the Phoenix? Right? And it, like, I was like, this is fascinating. We should do something with it. And we spend the whole first part about why he created that book how he mirrored it after a book by uh, Elliot Gorat, and how, and then, you know, I became a geek at Deming, I don't know, quite a while back, I'm pretty geeked out about Deming. But then we actually realized that there were three pillars to DevOps, and it was lean, and lean thinking, and a lot of the body of work that comes out of lean is just, it's so embedded in what we do, and then, you know, the stuff that I was talking about, like John Ospar, and so John was at Etsy, and he started studying some of the works of these people that study plane crashes, and, and they look for systems thinking, non-root cause, to try to figure out what are all the components that, that kind of like amazing that everything goes right kind of thinking, or kind of the, the uh, Murphy's law being wrong. And he started applying that at Etsy, and now he works full time in like incident. Uh, so we cover that whole. Um, body of work called Human Factors, Resilience, or Safety Culture. And then um, there's some just great material on learning organizations. So this, this thing is, is a primordial soup of like 50, well, if you add it all up, it's like 150 years worth of knowledge that are all kind of saying in certain parts the same thing. Um, you know, the fifth discipline, right? Um, you know, really, really hard book to read, but like, um, like, like you read it and like, oh my God, this is what we're trying to do in organizations. The five disciplines. Um, a lot of people, anybody who have heard of DOOR or the thing, it was originally based on something from a sociologist called uh, Ron Westrom, which tried to categorize, uh, not IT, but organizations with pathological or generative. And so another way to look at uh, complex systems is, uh, and again, I'm trying to go back to, like, I don't really talk in this presentation so much about the solutions, but the things I'm looking for to uh, adapt into the buckets of patterns you know, are you power-oriented, pathological, cooperation low, messenger shot, uh, failure scapegoating, novelty, new idea, like, you've been here for a week. How dare you suggest changing the production system, right? Um, as opposed to generative, which is high cooperation, messenger trained, risk to shared, um, you know, failure creates inquiry, um, and then uh, novelty, like, oh, hey, you're new here. You might be thinking in a way that none of us have been, none of us old 50, you know, 55-year-old staunchy overweight men have thought about. <laughs> and John Ospar, you know, again, I always worry if I'm going to run out of time, but John Ospar um, tells this great story. If you know John Ospar, you're on Etsy, and you should look him up or ping me, and I'll point to his stuff. But 
Um, he said that at Etsy, you know, they were very blameless, blameless postmodern, blameless retrospectives. And, and there was one new person that came in, and, and it was sort of a, an outage, and the person said, hey, I know what it was. So it's not just that we don't blame people for things going wrong. We don't allow people to accept blame. So this young person was basically, I know what it is. We can move on. I know how to fix it. And the elders, um, who were very cooperative and very generative culture, were like, no, 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 sorry, not allowed. that's not how we work here. Like, and the person was like, no, no, I know. I, I screwed up. I know exactly what I did. And then literally this argument turned into that person really didn't know what they did. And they wouldn't let that person just take that responsibility. So blame is, you know, and then, you know, I mean, if you listen to Sidney Decker, this actually at leadership too. I mean, I look, I work my way back. I start with the edge and work my way up because I know everything about the leadership by the time I've talked to everybody. So when I have those final conversations, they think they're getting a report out. I'm actually interviewing them at that point. And, and the interesting thing is, that, you know, one of the things that Sidney Decker, you know, again, great writer in safety and resilience, he would say that, you know, um, a very healthy organization is one where a leader can walk up and say, we're all in the company, and they're like, y'all, I don't know why we're broke right now. Not broke money, but why? Like, literally set up and say, I don't know why it's not working. We need to figure this out. I mean, we don't create cultures, especially in uh, um, public companies, that allow that type of stuff. But, like, it, it works. It's not just the edge. You know, it's leadership as well. All right, so the last one with 10 minutes left, which should work out just fine. Um, and the interesting thing about interviewing all these people, um, I told you earlier, like, if we get through that kind of breakthrough mode, and then you can't shut people up. Um, you literally have to say, hey, can, can let somebody else speak now. Let me tell you about the time my manager wouldn't let me and told me I had it. Sorry, all right, got it, got it. And you're not writing this down. Of course I'm writing it down. <laughs> uh, you know, you're in a little bit of trust. And I say, hey, I'm, I'm going to anonymize people. You know, I'm not going to put names behind the quotes. But then something glorious happens because, and again, I would say I was some brilliant person that architected this from day one, or I can tell you the truth, and it just accidentally happened that everything that you learned pretty much tells you in everywhere I've been in the last two years um, that your security and compliance is just theater. The, what the edge thinks and knows they're doing and what you think you're telling your internal auditors or your operation review boards is just not true. Just blatant non-truth. Subjective, not even close to objective, on a good day, 25% accurate. You know, and okay, keep running that way. So you get Equifax. And so what, if, what I find, like, the, the, the one I loved the best was, not only that, well, companies have ARBs, architecture reviews, product review boards, cabs. One company had so coupled their job scheduling system into their applications that they actually had a review board for their XML for the job scheduling system. Come on, so that's, there has to be some people violently objecting and feeling sick about that right now. That, that not only were they so coupled to all these other review boards, they had so coupled a job scheduling system into their applications. Hadn't heard about microservices yet, domain driven. And um, they actually had to have a review board for the XML. Because by the way, it was so crusty and rusty and coupled that if you did make a mistake in XML, it could break the whole system. That's another whole problem. Check boxes. You know, we, 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 we basically today, in most of our institutions, financial institutions that, where the stakes are incredibly high, they're human-to-human -human telephone games. I'm going to write this document that says, I think this is what it's going to do, and here's what it's going to affect, and here's my backup plan. By the way, it's a PDF I've been using for the last three years, and I never changed the dates. And I'm going to send that to some group that on Wednesday afternoon, and that group are, are people who have been doing it forever, who really have no idea what Spiffy or a service mesh or Istio or maybe heard a chef or puppet um, on a good day Ansible, but like could never possibly comprehend the complexity of an environment. And there, okay. Then it goes over to somebody else who looks at it and says, this is my system, and you ain't getting my system. All right, I'll let you on my system. 
nine months later, some internal auditor comes in and says, what's this change? Here's the remedy ticket. Oh, that my system person said it was okay. That person who has no idea what anything else that is other than like remedy said it was okay. And the person who we're not going to open up the backup plan or that basically has little notes in it is, if you read this, please call me because I know you never read this. Um, good, we're okay. Let's tell the, the external auditors we're fine. Right? I mean, that, that's how it works. I mean, somebody in this room tell me I'm wrong. Honestly, stand up, say you're full of shit. <laughs> if you're a web scale, I mean, if you're, if you're you know, um, so it's vulnerability theater, there are workarounds, and you have to basically uncover this by talking to the edge and having truth conversations and, and just tearing it down. And this is the one where the CIO gets incredibly mad. And one of my selling points is, I'm going to tell you things when I'm done that the big guys won't tell you. Because there's a good chance you're not going to give me any more work, and that's okay with me. Because I've had CIOs get, like, I mean, the fear of God that, like, what they attest in their audit isn't true. I've had pound, CIOs pound the desk. Tell me that cannot be true, John. I'm like, no, like, I was here three weeks ago. I didn't make this up. Do you want me to break out the quote wall? Let me tell you about your, one of your managers who told me we don't tell auditors things they don't already know. I can't tell you how many times I hear that expression and feel that we're doomed as a civilization. <laughs> Let alone IT and DevOps. Or, or SRE and safe or agile. And then people will justify, well, you know, John, you know, it, it's kind of hard to teach them all the thing. I, <laughs> all right, well, then fine, play your theater. We're going to tell them about Kubernetes next year, John. Is that okay? <laughs> now, there are some, you know, I kind of mix it with problems. And I, I, um, uh, um, Nike has this, their, their kind of compliance over talks about using negative ROI, like the cost of. Um, so, you know, I mean, the stakes are high, right? I mean, like I told you, Equifax thinks they got lucky because the people who compromised their system weren't really doing it for money. Because had they gone in there and changed data and hid the fact that they changed data, they would have had a real problem. In fact, for the last year and a half, unofficially, I've been told by people, all they've been doing, no productivity, by the way, is proving to the external offers the negative, you know, the, the negative, the, you know, like kind of negative proof, right? Like, the, like things, they, like how do you prove that something wasn't changed? And that's all they've been doing for a year. You know, so um, I hope Mark talks a little about what he's doing at A and Z. Um, Capital One's doing this. Um, I'm really, really interested. If you want to talk to me, I'm writing most of the, my part of the handbook is about this idea of of moving us. So the thing is, I can go to CIO, and we do this as DevOps experts. The cab is bad, get rid of it. And they look at you and say, yeah, do you run a $60 billion company? No. Like, here's the deal, John. And I, I don't do that anymore, say so get rid of the cab. Um, the, because they say, like, I've got, you know, there's a system here. I've got an audit. It's fine for you to t write a book and tell me that the cab is evil and it's wrong. But until you give me an alternative, I've got to call bullshit on you. And so I think the alternative is this notion that I'm seeing a, a couple of companies start, and, and I think it's, it's what I call moving kind of subjective attestation to objective attestation. And I know that might hurt your head, but, but basically what we do with the cab and the cab authority and the ARBs is we basically do kind of a subjective record of attestation of a change in our system. Um, separation of duties, right? Oh, yes. The checkboxes say that we did do separation of duties, right? Or we embed into the pipeline automated crypto evidence. And now here I'm going to say it. Everybody just calm down. Blockchain. <laughs> and, and the reason I, I, I say blockchain is because blockchain could be as simple as a Python crypto library or as complex as Ethereum. But conceptually, creating some form of crypto, non-human, interruptible, mathematical truth of evidence of objective attestation. And that means that if we have really separated our automation in the time you do your, your commit, that no human, like, so Tobo Powell, Capital One, he calls it the clean room, in that, like, the pipeline is ephemeral. They actually can attest 
that no human actually touches the code to build the pipeline. So the pipeline dynamically built, built, so they call it a clean room like on a chip fabrication, like that they can tell the auditors that not only from the time that they commit, even the infrastructure that deploys it, the deployable mesh or deployment or pipeline, that stuff can be attestable that no human. And now they're building this, uh, um, this attestation system to say all the control points that we value that must happen must be source control, must have pair, must have build, must have TDD, must have BDD, must have uh, vulnerability scanning that we're building a crypto, mathematically pure or immutable chain of events. So now they'll train their auditors to basically say, when they come in and they say, what's this change? They say, here's the um, distributed ledger hash. They understand that language. It's, it's, it's uh, immutable math. And we turn 35-day audits into half a day. Um, that's it. Uh, 40 seconds left. Uh, uh, DJ Slane has built this, uh, this kind of cool. I've got a lot of presentations. You look up on DevSecOps, and I didn't really go deep into that, but building all these things in an automated fashion into your pipeline so you actually can run kind of governance and compliance-based automation. You can do all the things, you know. Uh, beware, just vulnerability scanning with 17 seconds is not enough. Um, go look at false positives. Even the best ones are in the 30% 30, 30%, you know, the signal noise ratio. I mean, it is really hard with the complexity of all the dependencies of modern open source software or software today to actually be really good at do, telling you um, vulnerabilities. I mean, one last thing I'll say. I remember the guy who told me that he stopped getting any of the vulnerability. He made them stop breaking the build when he got... Um, basically in a SQL injection vulnerability, and he was doing no database calls in his code, right? Anyway, thank you very much. Um